been given a lot of feedback on this show from the very beginning to do some episodes on what it's like to become a home brewer from the very beginning. So today, we're going to start a series of episodes where we go through the basics of homebrewing. And today, we're going to talk about the very, very basics of homebrewing and most people's first brew, and that's brewing with extract. So stick around and learn about it today on Homebrewing DIY. Building recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes, as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on this show, like the till hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the cruisin ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast, and that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruisin. They are no match for scrubber duckies and you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard everywhere, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look, I shopped around for a place to post my podcast, and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the show that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this show covers it all. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the very beginning of homebrewing and the very basics. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and we're going to talk about brewing with extract. I'm very excited to do this series where we're going to do a six episode series on brewing for beginners. And uh, we'll see how it all turns out. But first, I would like to thank our patrons over at Patreon. It's because of you that this show comes to you every week. I'd like to thank a couple of our newest patrons. First, I'd like to thank Austin Manny, and I'd like to thank Rick Down. Rick actually comes from is a patron all the way from South Africa. It's kind of amazing to me how far the reaches of this podcast and this show. 
Well, if you'd like to be a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY today and give it any amount. We actually are no longer offering the dollar if you if you give it a dollar and get access to the RSS feed and a set of stickers. So we are now at 20 patrons that was hit. Rick down was actually the last person to get that. And we are now going into our basic setup for all of our patrons. So right now, if you give it the two dollar level or above, you're going to get a shout out on the show. And if you give it $5, you're still going to get a really special gift from our ad sponsor at Scrubber Duckies. And uh, just as an FYI on that, I did speak with Eric. He's the owner over at Scrubber Duckies this last week, and he is actually sending me out a new shipment. And I'm excited because I have a few patrons that are currently waiting for theirs. And if you would like to get yours as well, head over and give it that $5 amount. Next, I'd like to talk about another way that you can support the show is by heading over to Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com. If you're listening to this show on Apple Podcasts, all you got to do is scroll to the bottom of this show and hit a five-star review or even just give us feedback. Any feedback of this show helps us improve and it helps other homebrewers find the show. Another way to support the show is to head over to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and use our sponsor links. If you use our sponsor links, you can get some really great products like the brew bag at brewinabag.com. You can get Brewfather, or you can shop at Adventures in Home Brewing. When you do that, it's going to let them know that we sent you, and they're going to then in turn support the show. So head over to homebrewingdiy.beer. Next week, a week from today, is our Homebrewers Roundtable. It's going to be a really great, it's going to be a great Homebrewers Roundtable. We have Brian Rabe from Low Oxygen Brewing. He was a guest on this show. And if you attend, it is free. You just go to homebrewingdiy.beer and click on the events tab and sign up today. The last way that you can support the show is to use coffee, and that's ko-fi.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. And there you can actually give a monetary donation, but it's a single donation. And the idea is that you can go there and you can buy me a beer. I've had a few people do so, and I'm highly surprised at how easy and quick it is. So once again, that's coffee.com, ko-fi.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. And today is actually the kickoff day of HomebrewCon. So if you are attending HomebrewCon today, that's a really exciting place to be. It is going to be very different this year, considering that it is 100% online. I was attending a few really great uh, sessions today, and I highly recommend attending HomebrewCon. It's it's a, it's so far been a really, really good time. You can go over to the Homebrewers Association and even buy tickets still, and they're $99. But uh, yeah, uh, Homebrew can Con is in full action. So if you're going, love to hear your feedback and, and what you thought and if you had a good time. Now let's just dive into today's episode where we're going to do a deep dive on beginning homebrewing, and we're going to talk about brewing with extracts. This is a pretty exciting episode for me. I'm excited to really share the love of homebrew with a beginning homebrewer. I know that there's a lot of people who listen to the show week after week, and I'm really hoping that you're still listening to this show and you didn't just look at it in your thing and be like, oh man, I totally know about extract brewing. Because maybe as we go through this, we'll all learn something new. But what I want to do is kind of go through a step-by-step guide on Maybe your first batch, since your first batch could be an extract beer. So let's get started. Let's just say you're a brand new home brewer and you're starting off today and you want to get ready to brew your batch or you've thought about home brewing. Well, let's dive into what you actually need to do an extract batch. And Actually, the equipment needed is very, very little. It's actually very approachable, but there are some key things that you do need. You need, first of all, a kettle. I think that that is one of the essential ingredients in brewing any beer is that you have to have something where you're going to be able to boil liquid. The other place that is going to be essential 
is that you need to have something to ferment in. And there's a lot of different types of fermenters out there, all the way from plastic buckets to glass carboys. And you also want to decide the size of the batch of beer you want to make. A great place that people start is by making one gallon batches of beer. I have a lot of people that are following this show i have a couple of patrons of this show that actually brew one and two gallon batches all the time and that seems to suit them just fine i brew five gallon batches and my neighbor across the street brews 10 gallon batches you have to kind of decide what kind of level of commitment you want to make to the size of beer you want to make but if you want to make a one gallon batch you can do so in a small one gallon or two gallon fermenter like a, a two gallon demijohn is going to be enough headspace in the fermenter fermenting vessel to be able to brew a one gallon batch and that is something that's important and we'll get into as we get into the fermenters but you can do a one gallon batch you could do a two or three gallon batch you can do a five gallon batch you could do a seven gallon batch or you could even do a 10 gallon batch for your first batch but the idea is you have to make that choice of the size that you want to do and then you have to get the corresponding equipment to be able to do that size of batch so what I'm going to base everything on for this segment is a standard five gallon batch. The reason I'm going to do a five gallon batch is that that tends to be the when you go down and if you were to purchase a basic starter kit from a homebrew shop, they usually come in either a one gallon size or a five gallon size. Those tend to be the, the main things that you see on the shelf. So. Let's act like we're going to be making a five gallon batch of beer. And this is going to be our first batch of beer. And we're going to do so probably from an extract kit. And what is an extract kit? An extract kit is a pre-designed beer style. So the idea is that you could go to a local homebrew shop, you could go to an online brew shop, and you can kind of pick the style of beer that you want to make, not really have to think about too deeply about what the ingredients are in it and it'll be a, a predefined kit of ingredients that all the way from the yeast the hops the malt all of it is everything you're going to need to make that style of beer so i want to make an ipa i'm going to buy a kit and that kit is going to have all of the ingredients to buy that the the first things you're going to need though are the hardware so i would say the equipment that you're going to need to be able to brew this batch. So let's talk about a few key pieces of equipment that are absolutely needed to brew a batch of beer. And then I will dive into some pieces of equipment that are, I would say, going to make your day go a lot easier and are really a great nice to have. So the first key piece of equipment you're going to need is a brew kettle. Now, if you're going to be making a five gallon extract batch, I would recommend at least getting a three gallon kettle at the very, very base, the very, very minimum. And the reason you want to get a kettle that's, you know, two or three gallons in size is that there's a couple of reasons why the way the extract is brewed is that you're going to actually add water to the batch of beer later to get it topped up to the five gallon, the five and a half gallons you're going to need to make a five gallon batch. But on the other side of it is that if you are making the full volume, so let's say you made started with a six and a half gallon batch and boiled it down to five and a half gallons for your final product that goes into the fermenter, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle to actually get that cooled down quickly enough, right? You've got a mass of liquid that's going to need to get cooled down. And so uh, one of the great shortcuts when it comes to extract brewing is, and, and very different than all grain brewing is that you're going to be able to brew, get the sugars in it that you need, get your hop addition put in, and then be able to top your beer up to be able to have the amount that you want. And you should, because the amount of sugar going into it, because you're using malt extract, is going to be predetermined. And so it, it's kind of one of those things where you still want to check and get your numbers, but the idea is that you're going to not struggle to hit those numbers because you're not reliant upon mashing and conversion so uh, not to get too 
technical here. We're going to talk specifically about the equipment. You need to have a kettle and it, the very basics, if you're going to do an extract batch, I would recommend having a three gallon kettle. Uh, a flat bottom pet kettle is important. I would also recommend a stainless steel kettle. Um, the reason is, is that stainless steel is very durable. It's easy to clean. There's a, a lot of benefits to stainless steel, though you will find aluminum kettles out there that are very inexpensive, but, uh, you know, and, and you could totally use that. I'm not going to say that you can't, but it is a lot easier to clean from, from a stainless steel perspective and cleanliness when it comes to brewing, I think is one of the true keys. Whenever anybody asks me, Hey, Coulter, I'd like to become a home brewer. The first question I always ask is, how much do you like to do dishes? Because cleanliness is so important to home brewing. Now, the other big keys, piece of equipment that I think you need is obviously the fermenter. I know that I talked about that a little bit at the beginning and kind of got sidetracked, but the idea is that you're going to need to have some sort of fermentation vessel. I think personally, one of the best beginning first fermentation vessels out there is a plastic brew bucket. And the reason I like the plastic brew bucket so much is a couple of reasons. A, they're very inexpensive. You can get a, a fermenter for a plastic brew bucket that is around anywhere from 15 to $20. And we're talking about specifically made ones that are for brewing that are pre-drilled and all the things you need. They can even have bottle bottling spigots in them or whatever. But the idea is that you want to have something that you can ferment in. And I can't recommend buckets enough. The other reason I like buckets is that they're super easy to clean. The I you can get your arm in there. You can actually get in there with a sponge when it's time to clean it out and actually get that fermenter clean because once again, cleanliness when it comes to home brewing is so, so important. The other key ingredient that I think is is essential to all home brewing, and you, this is going to seem very, very weird at the beginning is you need to have a pen and a piece of paper taking good notes about your process is very important and any decent homebrewing kit that you buy specifically if you get one from a home a local homebrew shop should come with a, a sheet of paper that's going to allow you to take certain notes and the reason it's important to take notes of your process is that inadvertently when you make your first batch of beer if you make a beer, you should be happy no matter what the quality level is. If it's got, you know, alcohol in it and it has a bubbles in it, you should be happy that you went through the process and made beer. And you're going to want to have those notes to go back to so that you know what to change. And I'll give you another example. I like to bake bread. I'm really into sourdough right now. And when I am going through the process of baking bread, I take notes of what my process was, how things felt, what my temperatures were. And you're going to want to do all of those same things when it comes to homebrewing beer. You're going to also want to get a thermometer, whether it's a floating thermometer that's, you know, a few bucks or a higher priced digital thermometer. You're still going to want to get a thermometer. And it's really important because specifically in the cool down phase, you're going to want to know what the temperature is that you're pitching your yeast into, because if you pitch it in and it's too warm, you're going to struggle to have it be, you're going to struggle to have your, your, your fermentation go off well, or you could kill your yeast. So very important that there's a certain temperature threshold when pitching your yeast. And that temperature threshold is something you want to know that is what it is. So I think a thermometer is also very, very important. Another piece of equipment that is also going to be important in a new homebrew is a hydrometer. I know that it, I said at the beginning that the sugar amount in an extract batch is predetermined, but the idea is that you want to know what the target is and whether you hit that amount, right? So for example, let's say you are supposed to have 5.5 gallons uh, going into the fermenter and you ended up pouring in six and you didn't measure your sugar, you're going to have a different number than what the recipe kit says. And it's always good to check. A hydrometer is very inexpensive. You can buy them for about $5. And if you buy the graduated cylinder that goes with it, you're looking at the total setup being around $10 for a hydrometer. But it is a, an essential piece of equipment. 
the other thing you're going to need are bottles. You're going to need a place to actually condition your beer in order to have your beer become a carbonated product. And we'll get more into what it what bottling looks like in in that process, but the idea is that you're going to have to have some sort of bottles and you're going to need enough to actually fit 5 gallons of beer in. So, when we talk about that, you're going to need about 40 Eight, it's actually 55 12 ounce bottles is what I usually end up with when I brew, bottled a five gallon batch. And if you're going to need a bomber, so if you're going to do 22 ounce bombers, you're going to need it to be a, about 22 to 24 bottles there. The other option is obviously kegging. But I think that that's a, an entire show in itself, and we will get to that later. But essentially, if we're looking at the very big basics and having the basics, the best place to start is with bottles. Another thing you're going to need is some sort of large spoon. And I know that that doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but I'm talking like a really big spoon, like you know, something that you can stir a few gallons of liquid with, not just a large wooden spoon or something like that. Though it would work, but the idea is that you want something to where you can agitate the wart and stir things around a bit. The other thing that you're going to need as far as hardware goes is some sort of racking cane or a auto siphon. And that is because you have now five gallons of liquid that you need to figure out how to move around. And sorry, the easiest way to move things around it when it comes to large amounts of liquid is obviously a siphon of some way. So those are some basic pieces of equipment that you would need to get your first batch up and running and off the ground. Now let's dive in a bit to talking about brewing with extract. Now, there are a few different ways to brew beer. Actually, I would say three main ways to brew beer when it comes to styles when it, or, I guess, processes. The first way is obviously an extract batch, which is really the idea of when you're starting off with extract is you're really learning how to ferment. You are adding hops to the wort and you're learning the hopping schedule as well. But the idea and really the process that it's teaching you in home brewing is how to actually ferment beer and how to ferment beer well. So it's a great place to start because fermentation is where you a majority of the flavor of beer comes from. And so it is really a great place to start because once you hone fermentation, actually the rest of brewing becomes pretty easy. The second way is what they call a partial mash. And a partial mash might even be the way that your fermentation kit comes. So for example, let's say you go down and buy a kit. It might have a small bag of crushed grains in there that you're going to use to add color and flavor to your beer. So it might have you steep these grains for, let's say, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. And the idea behind that is that it's giving you the color and character of that style of beer. So if you're going to make an Irish stout, you're going to have to have some roasted barley in there that's crushed up because and some chocolate malt and some other things that are given give it that black character because the idea is that that extracts usually come as replacements to base malts and the specialty malts still need to be added the other thing that you're gonna the other way to do it is obviously an all grain batch which is the way that most breweries brew is with uh, all grain and if you're at a level of home brewing like for example i'm uh, i would consider myself a, a pretty avid home brewer i brew an all-grain batch i actually have brewed i brewed one extract batch this year and it was the first extract batch i had brewed in a few years there's absolutely nothing wrong with brewing with extract it's actually like i said a great way to learn fermentation and when I brewed an extract batch earlier this year, I brought it to my homebrew club and had I not told them, they wouldn't have known that it was extract. So just FYI, you can make a really great beer with extract. And so don't let anyone tell you anything different from that. The, so back to extract and what it is though. Essentially what extract is, is that it is a way of, of kind of replacing the base of your malt. So there, when you, you do an all grain batch, you have what are called base malts, which are the, the, the main source of sugar 
for your yeast to eat to create the alcohol that becomes beer. One of the things is that extract is essentially beer that is made in a factory. So there's a, like Muttons is a, is a brand of extract. They have a, a, a facility where they are taking a all grain batch and they essentially are boiling the wort with no hops in it all the way down until it becomes a uh, syrup. Then there's another kind of extract. So that's a, what we call LME. So that's liquid malt extract. And some of the batches that you're going to get out there when you buy a kit are going to either come with two types of extract. One is going to be LME and the other is going to become is be called DME, which is dry malt extract. And essentially it's even further processed from that liquid malt and then fully dried to a very fine powder. So essentially they've taken malt, think like a malt ball right? Uh, if you've ever had a Whopper, there's the malt in the middle. That's essentially what dry malt extract is, except for it's more powdered than f- formed into a ball. And it's then just like weighed in pounds. And it, it, whether it's liquid malt extract or it's dry malt extract, they usually just say, hey, you need to put four pounds of extract into this batch. And the idea is that there's a couple of things that are known in extract. A, the water chemistry is is known because all of the the water chemistry that was from the original beer is now just hyper concentrated in that malt extract so for example if you have an amber malt extract they've done the water chemistry for an amber type beer or if you have a pilsner type or a light malt extract uh, you're going to have the lighter colors so that is one thing you're going to know get from malt extract. The other thing is is that the sugar content is known. So if you put 6 pounds of extract into this amount of water, so for example, let's say you take 6 pounds of extract and you put it into 5 gallons of water, it is known based on that the exact gravity you're going to get. And that's why when you get your kit, it's going to say you should hit around a 5% beer or a 6% beer or a 7% beer because the amount of extract is known which is going in. And as long as you follow the directions, you should end up with that amount of beer. That being said, you still have your hydrometer and you want to test it and make sure. So let's go through the process of actually brewing a extract batch of beer. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to heat up some water. If you are using a dry extract or a liquid extract, one of the things you're going to want to do is, and I'm going to assume that you're going to come go down and buy a kit. And when you buy a kit, that kit is going to come with a bag of steeping grains. I I feel like at this point in home brewing, they usually come with steeping grains at this point, unless you're brewing a really light type of beer like for example if you got an extract kit for a saison it may not have steeping grains considering that it probably is 100 percent pills and dme that's going in there but i digress let's just talk about a standard kit and that standard kit is probably going to have a bag of steeping grains it's going to have your dry or liquid malt extract in there and it's going to have a packet of yeast in there And it's going to have um, a muslin bag and some uh, probably a couple of muslin bags. And it's going to have a few packs of of hops in there if or one pack of hops at least. So uh, those hops are going to be in little ounce packages. So let's talk about what you would do if you were going to brew this batch. First thing you're going to do is you're going to get your pot and you're going to fill it to the amount of water specified in the recipe. If you are going to be making a five gallon batch, chances are it's going to ask you to do about two and a half to three gallons of strike water. And you're going to heat it up to anywhere between 145 and 155. And that's usually what it says within the, that's usually what it says within the instructions. And then when you get that, you're going to get it up to temperature and you're going to have a small, a a muslin bag that's going to be in that, in that, in that kit that you're going to add your steeping grains to. And usually in those instructions, it's going to tell you to soak those grains in there without squeezing the bag for anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Now, 
I would go a full hour. That's just how I am. I like to be a little more thorough. But to be honest, I think 45 minutes is going to be enough. It's not rocket science here. And just follow the instructions that come in your kit. But let's just say you're going to soak those for about an hour. And you're just going to let them sit there. And you might want to stir them around a bit and let them soak. If you're making a darker beer, so let's say you're making like an amber ale or you're making a stout or you're making a even a Kentucky Common, I'm thinking of some darker styles, there's lots of them. The idea When you put that bag in, you're immediately going to see the color of the water turning the color of the beer you're trying to make. That is essentially what these steeping grains are doing. And you're going to let it sit there, but you want to try to keep the temperature as constant as possible. And this is going to be a little hard, specifically if you're on an electric stove. Electric stoves are a little tough. You're going to you're going to struggle to keep the temperature up because, for example, with an electric stove, the amount and we're talking a your glass top electric stove or your coil top electric stove that you would have in your house, not a, a giant induction burner like you would have in an industrial setting. But if you had this electric stove, what happens with them is that they take a long time to get up to heat and they take a long time to cool down to heat because they retain heat a lot. And so they're a little tougher to keep in a specific range when it comes to, you know, having only a couple of gallons of liquid in there. But you can totally do it. You just have to, you know, anticipate what's going on. With a gas burner, it is a little bit easier. So if you have gas burners on your stove, you can easily adjust the heat and it's going to be instantaneous. So for example, if you need to cut the heat, you can cut it. If you need to turn it up or turn it down, you can goose it. But the idea is you want to keep it as consistent as possible and for that entire hour. So keep it within at least that range of that like 145 to 155 that usually they have so that you can get those, those grains steeped and get the color and aromas that you want out of your beer. The next thing you're going to do is after the hour, you're going to pull that bag out. You do want to let the bag drain. So, for example, a, a great trick is if you have a colander laying around, you could actually take a colander, put it over your pot, and let that sit in there and just kind of let the, 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 the juices drip off. Or you can set it on a slotted spoon or something like that. But the idea is you do want to get it out there. You'll always see in the instructions that it says not to squeeze the bag. I brew in a bag personally, all grain batches, and I squeeze the hell out of my bag. There's a lot of controversy around whether or not um, you should or shouldn't. But considering that these recipes are based around not squeezing the bag, it's always a good idea to follow the instructions and not squeeze the bag. So you can, but you do want to let the water drain away so that you're not losing, you want to lose as little bit of liquid as possible because you want to get as much of that flavor and richness from those malts as you possibly can. In the meantime, what you can be doing is you can now be increasing your heat. So you can increase your heat and you're now shooting to get to a boil. One thing that I do as a trick and whether or not you always follow, and I'm going to do this with a disclaimer, always follow your instructions, is that once it gets to almost boiling is actually when I put my extract in. I don't wait for it to boil. I wait till it gets around 180 degrees is about where I would I would put it in. The reasoning being is that extract, just the way that it works, whether it's liquid or even dry extract, it just dissolves easier when the liquid's hot. If you try to dissolve specifically dry malt extract, really hard stuff to work with. If you're trying to dissolve that in cold liquid, it will eventually, but it takes a really long time. Whereas it, when it's hot, I feel like it, it, it dissolves a lot easier. But one thing that is really key here when adding your extract into your beer is to remove it from the heat. So if you are on a, an electric stove, like I said, you can turn it off and the burner still is hot. You want to remove it off of that burner and put it on a cold burner or even set it on your counter to mix in your, your extract. And liquid malt extract is even more prone to this because it sinks right to the bottom. And if you have the burner on, you risk scorching that and making a gooey mess on the bottom of your kettle that may be there for the rest of its life. And so really important, take it off the heat, get it mixed really well, and then place it back on the heat. Then you're going to get into the boil. And there's a couple of tricks going on here with the boil. When the, when you're bringing your, you're, you're about to, 
get to boiling, let's say you're around 195, is about when the hop break starts on a beer. And it really what it is is that the malts and the proteins that you just got and all these sugars start to really make this like crazy foam on the top of your beer. And this is where you can really risk getting a boil over. And I can tell you right now, my first batch, I totally boiled it over. And if you do it too, join the club. But you, you, I'm giving you this advice now. Just, you know, take off the heat, get it to a boil slowly. And I got a sweet trick for you. So quick homebrew hack here is get a spray bottle of water. And as that hot break starts to rise up, you're going to, you can spray it down with that water and allow it to not overflow. This is really important, especially if you're using like a three gallon pot and you have two and a half gallons of liquid in there. Or if you have a five gallon pot and you have 4.5 gallons of liquid, like you're, you're really close to the top. This gets really important because your risk of a boil over becomes a lot higher the closer you are to the top of the pot obviously but if you have enough headspace so let's say you had a five gallon pot you only have two and a half gallons in there you're probably going to be okay but still even then a great piece of advice have a spray bottle handy with on the spray setting and as that hot break starts to rise just hit it with some water and it'll bring it right down it's, it's a great trick and I highly recommend using that trick right out the gate then once you get to a boil, and we're talking a rolling boil, and a rolling boil is really important to brewing. It doesn't need to boil hard, but it does need to roll. You can't have it just be this like barely boiling thing. It does need to actually boil. But the idea is that once you're at a boil, that's when you're going to add your hops. And whatever beer you're making, your instructions are going to have a hop schedule. But you're going to have a few different charges, right? And that's what they're called is, is, a, is a hop charge. The first charge is going to be your bittering charge. And if you're making a classic style, so let's say you're making like a classic pale ale, you're going to have a 60 minute hop charge. So let's say your recipe says to put in one ounce of hops and for 60 minutes, what you're going to do is put it into a muslin bag that is given with you in the kit. You don't have to use the bag. I usually just throw my hops right in, but that's completely up to you. And you're going to put it in there. Now, there's a process happening here. This is called hop isomerization. I, this is such a hard word to say. But once you put that in, what's going on there is that is actually what's making your beer bitter. There are a bunch of acids and oils that are in hops, and they break down at certain temperatures. And actually, they start to break down at above 175 degrees. And so what you want to do is you got to get that isomerization, and you have to get it while you're doing the boil. And essentially, that is why there's two things that happen of reasons why beer is boiled. One is so that you can actually get your beer to be bittered from hops. And the other is obviously sanitary. Once you've mashed your beer, you've you've not really worried about sanitation. But post boil, everything needs to be sanitary, right? And so the idea is that once you in the boil, the boil is actually sanitizing the beer as well so that you're not going to have any other things living in it than yeast. So you're going to boil for an hour. Let's say your hop charge that is in your instructions is probably a one, two or three stage hop ch hop charge so you might have a 60 minute hops you might have what are called flavoring hops which usually come in the last few minutes of it so around 20 minutes left in the boil they might have you add a flavor charge and then usually with depending on the recipe you're going to have what are called aroma charges and those might happen in the last 10 or 5 minutes or even as a hop stand which is you turn the heat off and you might put more hops into it to allow it to get more aroma from the hops, but less bitterness. And so that is really what you're getting when you do that boil. So you're going to boil for one hour. And once you're done boiling, you're now going into what we call the cool down. And this is a real key part as well. A couple of things here. Once you're in the cool down, you are now essentially in the place where once you cut the heat from your boil, Everything that touches your beer right now needs to be sanitized. Now, there is going to be something that comes with your brewing kit from the beginning. 
And I should have talked about this because it, it it's not really a piece of equipment. It's actually a chemical. And you're going to have to have some sort of sanitizer. I actually did an episode of this show. I had five-star chemicals on this show. And we talked about what a good cleaning regimen looks like for a brewery. And I highly recommend you going back and listening to that show. It was a really great show. But let's just talk quickly about what you're going to need. You are going to need an alkaline-based cleaner. That alkaline-based cleaner is going to be what, what I prefer is PBW. You can use OxyClean as well. It's not as effective as PBW. PBW works on everything. Um, you also might look at it, see a brand out there called like One Step, that kind of stuff. Those are all your alkaline-based cleaners. The other thing you're going to need is what is called a sanitizer. And there's a couple kinds of sanitizers out there. Whatever homebrew kit you're going to buy is probably not going to come with a cleaner. So when you're at the homebrew store and you're buying your kit, buy the cleaner with it. And I highly recommend you buying an alkaline-based cleaner. And I highly recommend PBW. And... I would also recommend you buying a sanitizer. My personal favorite is Star San. There's also, um, you know, you can get uh, other types of sanitizers that are iodine based or even the no foam sanitizer, which is uh, called Sani Clean. But the idea is you want to get an acid based sanitizer. And it's really uh, what I also recommend when it comes to sanitizers, and it makes homebrewing so much easier, is a no rinse sanitizer. So that's why I like Star Sand. It's so, so much easier. And you want to make it to the instructions. It takes about one ounce of Star Sand to make five gallons of sanitizer. So uh, that is what we're going to, you got to have it. It's just a key part. Now, you are in the cool, the cool down phase. And so anything that now touches your beer has to be di dipped in your sanitizer bucket. So you're going to want to have a bucket or a pail or some type of large container that's going to hold your sanitizer. I make, when I brew a big batch, I make five gallons of sanitizer at a time. Another great hack out there though, is if you use distilled water, you can take your, you can make a star sand solution. And I do a quarter of a teaspoon of star sand to 32 ounces of distilled water in a spray bottle. And that also is going to help me. So like, for example, if I have a small thing, like a spoon that needs to be sanitized, Instead of throwing it in a bucket, I can just spray it down, let it sit there for 30 seconds in contact, and then use it. You do need to give it a full 30 seconds of contact with the sanitizer before it actually touches your cooling beer. And in the cool down phase, there's two ways to do it. You can get a chiller, and a chiller is a piece of equipment that you can buy at your homebrew store. They start at around $50 if you purchase one for a pretty inexpensive one. And if you're doing an extract batch, you don't need a really big chiller. But an immersion chiller is a great thing you can do. You can buy an adapter so that it fits onto your sink, and you basically put a coil of copper into it. If you are using an immersion chiller, you want to put the immersion chiller into your beer while it's boiling for the last 15 minutes to sanitize it so that you don't, don't worry about getting any bugs in there. Then when you move it over to your sink, you can hook your, your sink up to it via the inlet, and then they'll have a hose coming out, and you can just let that drain down the drain. Another way to do it for a home brewer is an ice bath. And an ice bath is obviously way less expensive. You just got to have enough ice to cool it down. But an ice bath can take a long time. And that is why when you do an extract batch, you want to do around two and a half to three gallons tops, even if you're doing a five gallon batch. Because if you were to do five gallons of hot water to try to cool that down, it's going to take you know, a couple of hours. Whereas if you only have, let's say two and a half gallons, you might be able to get it to cool down in probably 30 minutes or so. And especially if you do an ice bath and a couple of tricks with an ice bath are you want to get it into your sink, get it filled with a lot of ice, add salt to it. Salt actually will, it will melt your ice, but it will help it get a, it, it helps it get a lower cold point and it allows your ice to actually chill below freezing technically because like ice water gets to straight 32 degrees. But if you add salt to it, it can get a few degrees colder. So that's a quick trick, but it will help. You will go through a lot more ice. Another trick is to stir your wort as you're cooling because the idea is that is if you're stirring the wort as you're cooling, it's getting more, sir, you're circulating it towards the outside of where the cool is and the, the, the heat is still trapped in the middle. And so that's going to help you get it cooled down a little quicker. And so you just want, you don't need to like, you know, splash it around or anything like that. It's not a problem at this point, 
but you stirring it is going to help you get it cooled down quicker. Then once you get it cooled, you're shooting for a cut. Cu- there's a couple things that are going to happen. You're going to have what's called the cold break and it happens at around 120 degrees. Once you get below 120, all of the proteins that are boiling in your beer, hot particulates and that kind of stuff start to, come out of solution and fall to the bottom. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to get to that hot break, the cold break as fast as possible. Cause then it allows a lot more of that stuff to fall to the bottom and having that fall to the bottom means that it's things in your beer. If you're especially going for a clear style that aren't going to be there. Then once you get down to below a hundred degrees, this is actually what I call the longest time of the cool is below 110. It just takes a lot because you're now closer to room temperature. It just takes a lot longer to get it to room temperature. And so you may go from boiling to 140 really quickly, probably, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, but then going from 110 to probably, you know, let's say 68 degrees might take twice as long. So note that that is just kind of the deal when it comes to chilling, especially with an ice ice bath. And that's just kind of how it is. But what you're shooting for is 68 degrees when you're that, I call that pitching temp, if you're making an ale and you want to get your temperature down to that just below room temperature. It's always better to add your yeast to your beer. Even if your fermentation temperature is targeted for like 70 degrees, you want to always pitch cool and raise up to temperature, not pitch hot and bring it down to temperature. Just a quick tip or trick there to help you with some off flavors. But, uh, Yeah. So what I would say is your target should be around 68 degrees. Once you get it down to 68 degrees, you need to transfer your beer from your kettle into your fermentation vessel. So if you're using a bucket, it's pretty easy. All you got to do is dump the beer in the, into the bucket. Pretty simple. Uh, if you're using a carboy or something like that for your fermentation vessel, you're going to have to, you know, get either a large funnel that you can pour your kettle into. Uh, I don't recommend that if you don't have help. Another thing you're going to need is you're going to need to have a, you're going to, or, or if you have a siphon or a racking cane, that's another way to get it in there. If you have a pot with a ball valve on it, that's also an easy way to get it in. Cause then you're not having to lift many gallons, but we are only talking about, probably two and a half, three gallons. It's not going to be overly heavy and should be pretty easy to get in that vessel. Once again, we are talking that this is post boil. So your fermentate, your fermenter needs to be fully sanitized and anything that comes in contact with your beer past this point, even spoons, everything needs to be sanitized. And so very, very key piece of, of information there. Everything needs to be sanitized. Once you get it in there, you're going to now do what we call pitching your yeast. Um, well, I forgot. You only put two and a half gallons in. So now you're going to need to top up your water. Um, one thing that I do when I was brewing with extract, and just so that I always knew that I had the right amounts of water and I wasn't trying to measure things, was that uh, I would go down and I would buy a, a few gallons of the uh, distilled, not distilled water, but the spring water or, you know, just a really good tasting water that I would go buy, you know, six, one gallon jugs. And then I had, you know, I knew that if I needed five and a half gallons, it was easy for me to figure out what was, how much went in. So if I put in three gallons to boil down to two and a half gallons and needed to top up to five and a half gallons, I knew that I had all the information, all the, the measures around. So that was an easy way to get it taken care of. You could totally use your tap water, but when you use your tap water, you don't want to have any water with chlorine, especially if you have a really strong chlorine flavor, because that could actually give you an off flavor in your beer. So just to key thing when it comes to water, but you're going to want to top up your extract batch that you've just made to the full volume of what your fermentation should be. So you want to get it to that five and a half gallons. And then at that point, you're going to shake the hell out of it. Uh, you want to shake the hell out of it to get some oxygen in there and aerating your wort is really important right now because oxygen is what your yeast is going to need to live. Uh, then what, once you've air rated your wort, it's now time to pitch your yeast. What I would, if you're using a dry, most, most extract kits are going to come with dry yeast. So I'm going to assume you have dry yeast. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your yeast packet 
of whatever flavor you have, and you're actually going to dip it in your sanitizer bucket. You want to sanitize, you want to sanitize the packet. And if you're going to cut it open with scissors, which you should, you're going to sanitize your scissors and you're going to cut the top off and you're going to then sprinkle the yeast over the top of your wart. Some people talk about re rehydrating your wort and I mean, rehydrating your yeast. That is always a, a great option, which is you just get some warmer liquid, like around 95 degrees, and you're going to uh, water and you're going to take your yeast and sprinkle it in there and get it kind of warmed up and up and alive and rehydrated. And then you you would pour that right in, let it sit around for a few minutes. But I just sprinkle it in. It works just fine. They give you a big enough pitch in a dry yeast packet. As long as it's fresh, you've kept it refrigerated. You're not going to have any problems. So you dump it in and then I would give it another shake and then you're going to put your airlock on it. Now, the reason I, when we were talking about essential pieces of equipment is then I didn't mention an airlock is because essentially it's not really essential. Uh, you, I highly recommend you using an airlock. It just is a great way to make sure that there's no problems, but it's not a hundred percent essential to make beer. When you do an airlock though, um, they're about $2 for a three piece airlock and a bubble airlock I think is also $2 and you'll need some sort of a cork or a bung, or if you're using a bucket, it'll have a hole drilled for the airlock to go into. Um, you're going to put that in there. Uh, and once you plug it in, you, you then get it in there. You now have a sealed environment. So, uh, once you, and one thing, when you fill your air walk with liquid, don't use water. Just what I always use is the sanitizing solution. I just use to, for brewing beer or another, uh, I have a friend that loved to use vodka in his, I, and then he always told me a joke that his wife drank all of his vodka that he used for airlocks. Funny. Um, but the idea is that uh, you can use whatever you want. Just make sure it's not just water. And uh, once you uh, get your airlock in, you now are ready to ferment your beer. Once you ferment your beer, you're going to uh, leave it in a room temperature area. I would say try for a cool area in your house. Um, I always say the northeast corner of your basement is a, a great place to start. The reason being is, is that uh, fermentation is actually going to generate heat. Um, it's going to increase your heat by a couple of degrees, not a ton. But the idea is that if you are going to be fermenting a beer and it is going to be fermenting at room temperature without temp control, you want to get it you know, into a cooler part. You want to have it be in the mid to low 60s. The reasoning being of having it in the mid to low 60s is that you're going to set yourself up to not have any type of overheating off flavors. Because let's say it's sitting at... 70 degrees in your yard in your in your in your front room and it's fermenting you're you're actually generating heat from that and you actually could be generating heat that you're fermenting actually at 74 75 degrees even though the room temperature is 70 so just a quick tip or trick when it comes to a small thing that might help you make better beer would be to try to get it into a cool spot also keep it in a dark area Put a shirt around it. Do something. But the idea is that, uh, you know, light and oxygen are always bad at this point. After you start the fermentation process, you don't want them to touch your beer. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, we want to keep it in a dark space without light. Then after you have let it fully ferment out and depending on the gravity is how long it will take. When you're first starting to brew and this is your first batch, Patience is going to kill you. You're going to want to open it up. You're going to want to play with it. You're going to want to see what's going on in there. Stop yourself. Don't touch it. This is the, the true test of patience when it comes to brew. Forget about it, right? Um, leave it in there for like 14 days and let it do its thing. Let it get fully ferment out. You're not really going to have a, a way of telling. And if you have a glass carboy, you might be able to see that, hey, it's actually fully settled out and all that kind of stuff. Let it do its thing. Let it fully ferment out. If you're doing it in a bucket that isn't see-through, you want to wait till there's no more activity in the airlock, though that's not a good indicator. The best indicator to tell if it's finished is what using uh, your hydrometer, taking a sample of your beer, putting it into your graduated cylinder, everything sanitized, and doing it and checking if you're at the target gravity that was in your instructions. So if your instructions say to get to one point, 
0.010, then that once it gets there, you want to wait two days and test it again. And if it's still at 1.010, you're done. If it's moved, you want to give it a couple more days and make sure that it's finished fully. If you don't, you then risk having yourself a nice bottle bomb, which is not a good time. Then once it's finished, uh, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, a lot of brewing instructions are going to tell you to move it into another vessel for secondary. I think we're now at a place in home brewing where secondaries are kind of considered a bad thing. I wouldn't say a bad thing. People still do them and it's completely up to you whether you want to. I don't do secondaries and most homebrewers I know don't do secondaries. The reason being is, is that it just increases the risk of infection. And right now you're a new brewer. Anything you can do to mitigate infection is just going to be the right thing to do. So, I would just say, let it sit long enough to where it fully settles out. If you have a refrigerator that can fit your bucket into it, throw it in the fridge for a day. Cold crash it. That's always a great way of getting your beer to really settle out and get all of the things that, that are kind of floating in there, yeast and, and hot particulates and all kinds of stuff, protein, and it'll just settle it down into a nice thick yeast cake that's really dense. So I, I love a good cold crash. I, have a, I currently have a beer cold crashing in my fridge right now and has been for like a week. I, I think at this point I'm lagering it, but that's a whole nother conversation. So once it is actually sitting and ready to, to, to bottle, you're going to then get into your bottling phase. Now, you're de depending on the t type of beer and what the gravity is, you're going to have a certain and, and how many atmospheres, the, the type of carbonation level that it's going to ask for. I would say follow your instructions on how much sugar it has to add. Usually it comes with a packet of sugar that is the exact right amount. So go with that. Uh, but always read your instructions. And what you're going to do is it's going to tell you to add a little bit of water to it and dissolve the sugar fully. And then it's going to have you add it to your beer. Um, if you're going to do bottling that way, I highly recommend you then getting what's called a bottling bucket. Um, they're, they're not super expensive and they have a spout that's going to allow you to have a bottling wand on the end of it. That's going to make this entire process a lot easier, though not required. You can do so with a racking cane and a siphon. And actually when I bottle, that's what I use. But the idea is that if you're going to be bottling solely, get a bottling wand and a bottling bucket, it's just going to make your life a lot easier. So you're going to rack, you're going to go from your fermenter into your bottling bucket and you're going to leave the yeast cake behind and try not to get as like, try to get as little bit, well, as little of the yeast as possible into your beer. You don't want to be like sucking up huge cakes of yeast into your bottling bucket. And then once you get it into your bottling bucket, you're going to add your sugar solution and you want to give it a, a, you want to mix it well without actually agitating the beer as little as possible uh, you don't oxygen is the killer of good flavor and so you want to make sure that you get as little of oxygen in as possible in the beer as you're moving it once you're actually now in the bottling phase you want to make sure all your bottles have no labels on them that they're fully clean inside um, there's bottling brushes you can buy at the homebrew store that make it so easy to clean bottles you want to make sure they're you know very clean and there's no beer left in them and cigarette butts. I mean, you would be blown away of what's in a beer bottle. I think we all know, but you want to make sure they're super clean. And then you want to have a bucket of sanitizer and a, and a, and a good soak in a sanitizing solution. And what I do, and here's the tricks you're going to learn about bottling because bottling truly sucks, at least in my eyes. Uh, but when you're bottling one thing, my favorite trick is do it on your dishwasher door. And the reason I say to do it on the door of your dishwasher, if you, if you have a dishwasher is that when you bottle on your dishwasher door, you're going to inevitably, in, inevitably spill beer is part of this process. And so instead of putting it on your floor, you put it in the door, of your dishwasher. And when you're all done, you lift the door and it all goes down the drain. So quick trick there that is going to help you a ton. I remember bottling my first batch and I was doing it on my kitchen floor and my kitchen floor was soaked in beer. So just that's a great trick there you're going to have to have a bottle capper the bottle capper um, usually will come with your basic kit if you buy one if not a bottle copper costs about ten dollars for a wing a basic wing capper um, you don't need anything fancy there's the big ones with the arms on them they work great too um, they do take a little less effort but a wing capper is going to work just fine you're going to need some caps and you want to make sure that they're sanitized as well and a 
quick trick when it comes to bottling is set your bottling bucket over your dishwasher door and you're going to think that you're going to need a hose, right? And you do, but you're going to like, when you go to the homebrew store, they're going to sell you like a six foot piece of hose. And the idea is that you put the hose to the bottling bucket. The bottling bucket has a spout at the bottom. That's a little barbed and you're going to put that on there and you're going to walk around with the wand and go from bottle to bottle to bottle. Don't do it that way. That's going to be so messy. The way a bottling wand works is it's a, a plastic tube. It's, it's a hard plastic tube. And at the end is a little white light end to it that has a little red tag on it. The little red tab at the end actually is a seal. And when you push it at the bottom of the bottle, it opens the seal. And when you lift it off, it, un- it, it closes the seal, right? It's meant to make bottling easier and cleaner. So here's the, here's the trick. Take about a one inch piece of tube, one inch, two inches tops, right? Cut it off. And you're going to put your bottling wand right into that one end of it and you're going to take the other end and you're going to put it right into your bottling bucket essentially your wand is going to hang in the air suspended straight from the bucket it's not going to touch the ground it's going to be hanging over the top of your dishwasher door and you're going to have all your bottles laid out there and what you want to do is you want to take each bottle and lift it up to your bottling wand and fill it that way and then once it gets right to the rim you want to actually fill it to the top and you pull back once you take the bottling wand out you'll have the perfect amount of headspace sitting in your bottle and then you're going to then cap it and move on now the battle the bottling process is the next process when it comes to making your first batch of beer and the bottling process is once completely and you've bottled all your beers and you've capped all your beers you're now going to want to put them in the same room or even you can even put this in a little bit warmer still has to be dark uh, of where you did your fermentation and you want to leave it there for at least three weeks. People, you're going to want to open it. You're going to shake it around. You're going to want to look at it, ignore it. You want to get, just don't think about it, but you want to actually let it sit for that full three weeks. Don't do two weeks. Do three weeks. If you can go four, go four. The reason is, is what's going on in there is you you added a little more sugar to it. There is always some yeast in the suspension. You haven't filtered this beer out. And so the yeast that's in suspension that you use to ferment your beer is going to come back alive and eat the sugar you just added into that solution. And in that process, it's actually going to carbonate your beer. And if you open it too soon and don't give it enough time, you're going to lose your carbonation or it's not going to be carbonated enough. And so this is where patience is key. Again, let it wait for that three weeks. And then at that point, you're going to open your first beer and you're going to enjoy it. And so I hope that I went through a detailed enough instructions on brewing your first beer and doing it from an extract kit. It's been a long time since I've brewed a beer like that, but I think I remembered the full process. And I hope that it's something that helps a new home brewer learn the basics of home brewing. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for sticking around. I think that I am I really enjoyed going through the process and remembering the entire process of me brewing my first extract batch. It's, it has been a few years since I've done so, but you know, Everybody's got to start somewhere, and I hope that this episode helped you start somewhere. That being said, um, always follow us. You can always follow us on Instagram. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all social medias. Just look for us at Homebrewing DIY. Well, that's it for this week, and we'll talk to you next week on Homebrewing DIY. <laughs>